Northeast Community Initiative Program uh, Oversight Committee, the North Northeast CDI Oversight Committee, to be exact. We are so happy that you've made some time this afternoon to join us. Um, I would like to share with you that this is a public meeting and the purpose is for transparent community service and community work. Um, we would like to have your input, but we ask that you save all of your questions and comments to the end of the meeting, at which time you will have the floor and be able to share as you will. Uh, with that, um, again, welcome. And we will start by introducing uh, the committee to everyone. Kim, would you like to begin? Hi, uh, I'm Kim Moreland, and I'm, I work with Prosper Portland, and I uh, support the North Northeast CDI Oversight Committee. Hi everyone, my name is Oscar Arana. I work at the Native American Youth and Family Center and I'm a committee member. I'm Dorsey Johnson with the Multnomah County committee member. Gwyn Thompson, uh, co-chair. Uh, Morris Roman, co-chair. All right, that's everyone. And, uh, oh, great. Uh, uh, Tori Campbell, Prosper Portland. Currently, manager entrepreneurship, community economic development team. Yes, round of applause. New job, congratulations. Yep. I'll be stepping into a new role here in a couple of weeks as yeah. director of economic third. development. So, thank you. You can go right here. Okay. Yeah. And we've saved the best for last. Jen, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Jennifer Huang, committee member. Do we have quorum? Smith quorum. I think we do. I believe we do have quorum um, okay. with the nine standing members. Uh, so five will make a quorum. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So we're going to begin by reviewing our minutes from our last meeting. If you would please locate your minutes and take three or four minutes to read those over. We will then ask for a vote for approval. One more minute. Okay, we'll be looking for someone to make a motion to approve the minutes. Oh, sorry. Do you need a little more time? Oh, I'm good. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, Jennifer, you do the motion? Yeah, sure. Oh, do we want to do the cards or motion? How's, we could do cards, perfect, okay. Approving now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Motion, motion carries, uh, minutes are approved for our last month's meeting. Excellent, minutes are approved and documented. 
So with that, we would like to invite our first guest, someone that we were waiting for for quite a bit of time, Ms. Lindsay Jensen. Can you please come up and join us? Please do. We're so happy you can make it, Lindsay, since uh, you were not able to at our last meeting. So thank you for being here. Yes, thank you so much for rescheduling and being flexible. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, so just to introduce myself again, I'm Lindsay Jensen. I'm the director of the Center for Opportunity in North Portland. And I'm Bab Sadamski. I'm the manager for business development and small business support at the Center for Opportunity. Cool, and I printed copies of our presentation. It's also up on the screen. Um, I just wanted to start by saying, why are we here tonight? Um, so first and foremost, the Center for Opportunity is part of the NPI, or Neighborhood Prosperity Network, um, funded through Prosper Portland. Um, and what's also unique about us is we are part of the interstate urban renewal area. And so I thought it was really important that we came together um, and you know, started talking more and, and working to collaborate. So we're really excited to be here tonight just to introduce the Center for Opportunity and talk about potential ways to collaborate. So I don't think this is the only time we'll get to talk with you all, I hope not. Um, so I'm looking forward to future conversations. Um, and specifically, we wanna talk about ways um, to strengthen our workforce programming in the interstate urban renewal area um, and to find ways to better serve businesses owned by people of color in the interstate or in our section of the interstate urban renewal area. So that's why we're here. And to just give a quick overview of the Center for Opportunity, um, we were founded in 2010. We were actually one of the original three Main Street organizations. Um, and we shifted away from the Main Street model in 2016, um, which is when we became the Center for Opportunity. And our mission and vision, which is on the screen, is we empower marginalized communities in the North Columbia area of Portland through community building, addressing basic needs, and people-centered economic development. Our vision is that we envision a thriving, diverse, and just community where everyone has access to affordable housing, benefits from economic opportunity, and is civically engaged. Um, which I love, I think it's a pretty awesome mission and vision. So what do we actually do? Uh, we have what we call our three areas of work within the organization, um, and Babs will talk in just a second about our economic empowerment work, um, because I think that's really where we see a lot of energy and synergy to work with you all. Um, but our first area of work is around economic empowerment. Um, and so this includes connecting neighbors to living wage jobs, helping neighbors build, build assets and save for the future, providing job training, um, and supporting businesses in our service area. So our second area of work is around building community resilience. Um, and we do a lot to support neighbors with basic needs, sparking civic engagement, um, and developing, uh, doing leadership development work in the community. Um, and then our third area of work is around neighborhood placemaking. So we do a lot of cool live events in the neighborhood, such as the farmer's market. Um, we do national night out events. We do art walk programming, et cetera. So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, the next slide just talks a little bit about our, our unique approach. Um, and I think this is pretty true to the neighborhood prosperity network in general. Um, but people are really at the core of our work and who we are. Um, we are driven by social justice and equity, so we hold a lot of the same values that this committee holds as well. Um, we target our resources towards marginalized communities in North Portland. Um, we're creative, we do cool things, um, and we, we collaborate a lot with other nonprofits and community groups in North Portland. So, the next slide just gives you a snapshot of our team right now. We are what we like to say, we're small but mighty. Um, we have four paid staff members, and we also have um, affiliated partners who do office hours at the Center for Opportunity. So one is MISO, the Microenterprise Services of Oregon, is on site doing uh, business coaching with us. Uh, Busy Lizzie Social Media Marketing is on site uh, at our office doing hours, and then ERCO, is also on site providing job uh, coaching for our organization. So that's a bit about our team. Um, the next slide shows our service area. 
we, it's kind of a little small and hard to see, but essentially we uh, serve the St. John's, Cathedral Park, Portsmouth, and University Park neighborhoods. Um, and I also have another handout that I passed around that actually shows what sections of the URA that encompasses. And this is in my very grassroots manner. I literally hand wrote on it. So, you know, it's cool. Um, and this is a little bit new for us. So we tr were originally founded again in just St. John's and we've recently expanded into other parts of, of the peninsula or the North Columbia area. Um, and we're really excited about it. Uh, we've sort of naturally been working and supporting the businesses there because there hasn't been a lot of other resources in that community. And so we just thought, you know, it's time to make it official and actually call this our service area and be more intentional about serving folks in those neighborhoods. Um, the next slide, I won't go into too, too much, but it just gives um, some demographics of St. John's. And I pulled these numbers just so you know where the source is from the Portland Housing Bureau, um, which they define St. John's as all four of those neighborhoods anyway, so I thought it was a good representation. Um, so I'm going to turn it to Bob's to actually talk a little bit about our business um, support programs and our workforce development. Okay, I'm going to start by talking about the um, small business support that the Center for Opportunity provides. Um, similar to um, the other prosperity initiative areas where storefront grants are administered, we have a program for promotional and um, storefront improvements. Um, this last this calendar year, 11 businesses have taken advantage of the Starfront grant improvements, and in a small area such as St. John's along Lombard, it makes a meaningful change um, for those individual businesses and then for the district. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, we also have technical assistance for businesses that is supplied through our partnership with MISO. And um, we're in a transition. We are getting a new um, technical assistant coming into our office who has been with me so for a while and will be expanding our reach some because she's already worked with some businesses um, in North Portland. Um, and the same. Um, or we also have Busy Lizzie social media, which um, Lindsay mentioned. We have two committees that are made up of volunteers. One is the business resource team, and they help us review grant applications. And they also have assisted in a check-in that we do every year with priority businesses. This year, we have 42 priority businesses that are owned by people of color and the business resource team is doing in-depth interviews with each of those businesses to see how it's going and to offer resources that we're providing, but on a one -to -one, in a one-to-one -one conversation. Um, additionally, we have efforts to strengthen the individual businesses with um, promotional, with the promotional grant and then this last holiday season, there was a holiday pop-up market that was in an existing business where that had extra room. And so some artists um, partnered with a business owner that had children's clothing and sportswear. And they, their, their sales were quite successful, sort of feeding off of each other's markets. Um, then we have events. Um, we have an art walk that happens every three months um, in March, June, and then September. And the last um, art walk had over 20 artists presenting in stores through the area. The St. John's Bazaar is fiscally sponsored by the Center for Opportunity, and it is the street festival that goes along with the St. John's Parade. Um, and then we have a weekly farmer's market in downtown St. John's that goes from May to October. A additionally, there is a small winter farmer's market. 
So all of these efforts support the businesses in some way, either by creating events, but also individual support. So our connections with businesses are not always um, sort of a one size fit all. It's often engagement and finding out what each business needs. Um, we currently have 492 identifiable businesses in our reach, um, but I know because I work out in Rivergate and am working on an effort to bring Rivergate manufacturing and logistic firms into our workforce development program, I know that there are some out there that I'm still finding, so I expect that number to grow. Um, Okay, I have to pause because that was a lot of talking. <laughs> okay, so on the workforce development side, um, we have on our website and also in our office a jobs board that is called Jobs in St. John's. Um, it probably could be called North Portland or North Reach Jobs because um, I post jobs that go across professional lines, anything from um, an engineer to a dishwasher to um, someone working at a grocery store. And we have over 800 hits per month on our website. Um, we also offer in, partner or in our partnership with um, Berenia Ramirez from ERCO today, we gave a bilingual job search workshop at the St. John's Branch Library. And then Berenia um, from ERCO provides job coaching one-on-one -on -one with clients in our office two days a week. Um, currently, the Rivergate area um, is experiencing a difficulty in filling positions. There are over 600 empty jobs in the Rivergate industrial area. And if you look at the map of the area, it is the um, spot that is on the north side near Kelly Point Park. It's between downtown St. John's and Kelly Point Park. And the issue that has been identified by human resource managers is a lack of transportation into the area. Um, we have been working on that with a group called the Rivergate Transportation Advocacy Group, and it's made up of HR managers, transportation advocates, and stakeholders from different agencies, um, including Port of Portland and PBOT. Um, and TriMet. And so we are nudging along improvements in service, and we are also sharing information about those jobs and encouraging people to carpool and find alternative ways of accessing the available jobs. Um, the, this summer has also been good for the young adults in our neighborhood who have been seeking work. Um, I engaged with the Summer Works program, and we were able to place over 20 Roosevelt High School students in internships in North Portland. And that was a big success. And in additional to that, the St. John's Farmers Market has four interns this summer. So we're normalizing it for um, young adults to be working in our neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on. So just the, the last slide to kind of wrap up our presentation. And again, I'm hoping we can continue conversation. And, and I really, I, it was great. I met with Maurice and Gwen earlier, and we started talking about some of these ideas for collaboration. Um, and one of the things that we came up with was doing, creating some sort of peer mentorship network uh, for businesses owned by people of color, and particularly black-owned businesses. 
in our community. Um, and as St. John's grows and expands um, and uh, commercial rents get higher, there's a huge risk of displacement. And so we are very aware of that and really thinking about different strategies to support and, and sustain businesses that are in our community. And so um, I'm really interested in what that could look like um, because I think hearing from peers is really powerful. Um, the other one that we realized we don't do a ton of and we really could do more is um, helping to link um, POC-led contracting businesses to opportunities in the interstate urban renewal area. Uh, really, there hasn't been a ton of development in kind of our corridor of, I mean, there's been development, but not a ton of opportunities for folks in our community. And so we're really interested in building bridges and gaps. And I see this committee as being a really awesome resource to help us do that. Um, the other idea we had kind of thrown around and talked about was seating. So as Babs mentioned, we did a holiday pop-up market last year. We had over 30 artists. Most of them were people of color. Um, and we are really excited to continue that program and we'd love to have a year-round storefront where we did sort of, I called it the My People's Market style storefront um, because we realize that having that opportunity is really important in our community. And so I, I could see there being potential ways to collaborate with this crew on making that, that possible as well. So yeah, the next slide is just questions, ideas. <laughs> so that's us. Thank you so much. What a thorough and um, heartfelt presentation. Clearly, you enjoy and care about the work that you do and the people that you serve. So thank you for coming in and sharing that information with us. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? We typically just put our cards up. Oh. Hi, Alicia. Hi. Oscar. Hi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have a question. We. We oversee uh, an NPI in the Cully neighborhood, so I'm familiar with the work that you guys are doing. And one of the things that I wish that we were connected to in Cully was the opportunity of having a larger URA to be able to even um, grow our programming and expand our services even more. So curious about the, you know, curious to know why it took this long <laughs> to come and try to collaborate and try to create these partnerships? Oh, Oscar, you need both. <laughs> so, I, I am really actually truly excited about the work that's happening in Coley right now to have a community-driven URA, and I think that's been a real challenge for the interstate URA, honestly, is it's been very siloed. Um, and I think for the longest time, this committee didn't even know that we existed, or members of this committee didn't know that we existed, um, and so, I think you know I've been trying to advocate to be here to, to build those connections, and so I'm really hoping that it can be done differently next time and be more community driven, and collaborative, um, and so that folks kind of know what's going on across the board. But yeah, I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> I like to add to that too. Yeah. I'm really excited about um, our collaboration and and you know moving forward, and uh, my mind is just spinning with ideas of of ways to kind of connect to the workforce program and also connections with Roosevelt High, Roosevelt High School. And I was, you know, really looking forward. I, I'm sorry it has taken so long, but we do have a staff that works closely with um, St. John's Opportunity Center, Damien um, Crowder. So we've been connecting with um, the MP MPI through his leadership and, and commitment to St. John's. But so I'm looking forward to connecting this this group to to your work and so look forward to hearing from us soon <laughs> yeah and damien is a huge champion so i want to give him a big plug because he's awesome and been a really big champion for us so yeah and i wonder too have you uh applied for the community liv livability grants yet and then also have have you or your staff members worked with your clients or the business that you're working with to connect them to the resources in the North and Northeast Action Plan? Yeah, yes. Um, so we actually, we haven't applied for a community livability grant and the main reason is because we receive district improvement funds through the interstate URA 
and we are able to distribute those and, and support projects in our community. Um, there have been a few uh, churches who have actually benefited from the Community Livability Grant, which has been great. So we definitely spread the word as much as we can, as well as distribute some, some love ourselves. Um, and definitely, I mean, as, as much as we can connect folks to resources, you know, I think we found it a little challenging because not a lot of businesses have qualified for loan programs currently available, but I know that's shifting and there's new products coming out that will, I think, be a little bit more accessible for some of our business owners. Um, but yeah, a great example is we've had a few, um, Dubs is a great one. He got a big storefront improvement grant, um, you know, through that program, we were able to connect him to that. But there's, yeah, we definitely do the best that we can with that. And I did give a loan application to two different business owners this last week for PDC, a small PDC loan. So. Oh, sorry, Osper. <laughs> I'm still there. <laughs> um, so that is on my, um, yeah. I keep it in my file of resources and share. Yeah. Great, thanks so much. I'm, I'm impressed that you have copies of loan applications. So that, I hope. That's pretty impressive. As soon as I found out, I was like, we need those, Damien. <laughs> Great, thank you. So, yeah, um, thank you. I, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to get the numbers right. So, Lindsay, you mentioned having supported 11 businesses in 2019. Is that right? So, Well, I actually said that. So that's storefront grant that where they have completed their projects and okay. um, sent in their accounting. But there's also promotional grant money that's going. And then our assistance to local businesses, our North Portland businesses, is much broader than that. Those are just the numbers for um, money or for those two grant programs that have come through Prosper. Yeah, we could, I'm happy to send you the numbers. I mean, our impact as a whole through all the different programs is much larger between right. the art walk programming between technical assistance like i think within a quarter Sharo had served 50 businesses just through her technical assistance work um so it, it's i'm happy to provide those numbers if that feels helpful no, but it's, it's okay i was just yeah. looking here where it says number of businesses assisted was 42 so i just wanted to yeah, distinguish the, between i knew that the 11 was like, solid oh. number one to distinguish between those two there okay and i'll explain the number 42. Those are 42 businesses that are in my priority list that are owned by people of color. And those businesses are getting one-on-one -on -one check ins during the, the summer months. So we have priority businesses over 100 that are either owned by women, um, someone on the LGBTQ spectrum, or a person of color. But for this round, we're particularly focusing on businesses owned up by people of color. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? You know, I guess this isn't necessarily a question, but a statement. I really appreciate meeting with you guys, um, but and I continue to encourage you because there's all the PIP grants and PIP loans, and to really look at those businesses. And I'd love to start seeing more of those type of applications come through. The programs that we're trying to, you know, utilize, and I think you guys are doing a great job. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Yeah. So next on our agenda, we have Mr. Toy Campbell. Yep. Would you like to join us? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I, can I stay here? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so I want to just take a few minutes, we have a few updates to give on transitions that are happening within um, this, the team that has been me, comprised primarily of Yvonne, Kim, and myself, and then also talk around some of the uh, organizational chart uh, that we have made some modifications to further just support the work that you're doing. I know that a lot of effort has been put around restructuring the subcommittees, again, realizing that that's where uh, the, the predominance of a lot of the work is going to have to happen. Um, I think we've all noted that although we've done really good work over the last few years, some of those buckets in terms of the action plan really also need just additional staffing support from Prosper Portland. 
Um, and so we've been able to make some, some both some adjustments on teams as well as actually having to hire some folks with those particular skill sets just to help strengthen and bolster uh, the work that Kim has been leading. So I just want to take a few minutes to go through uh, the organizational chart, talk a little bit about it. But I first want to start by saying um, that obviously tonight, uh, I think you guys got the email that a number of us are on the move um, in some kind of way, and yet our commitment to um, the goal of this committee and the work of the action plan still uh, we have deep resolve in doing that as an agency. And so I just want to talk a little about some of those transitions. First and foremost, um, Yvonne um, was received a promotion. And so she actually now is moving over to our business and industry team where she, um, she will be working with supporting our clusters and also focusing on international affairs and activities. And so obviously she's been an integral part to this work. She will be missed. And uh, we were are con in, in the process of kind of restaffing that position. So once that new person comes on board, we'll provide you updates along the way. Um, another transition is mine. Um, if you haven't heard that um, I recently was offered the position that I applied for to be the director of our economic development uh, department at Prosper Portland, I've accepted that. And so that naturally begins to mean for me a transition from this work. Um, so we're just trying to figure out how to thoughtfully do that um, because I think all of you know so much of the work is not just the technical chops and skills that you need to have someone sitting at that table. It's also the relationships that have just been forged with grinding it out for the last few years and doing good work. Um, so that will also mean that Kim Moreland and in terms of the project management, she also is shifting to a new team within our agency, which is our development investment team, which technically is the appropriate place historically where action plans within urban renewal areas have resided. We just felt like because of the nature of this work um, and really the, a strong emphasis early on in the need for like community engagement and support, it made more sense for it to be in my team. Um, and so what we're doing within the, the old org chart, which I think we've made available to you, it's up on the PowerPoint. Doesn't make it any easier to see it. Uh, just looks like a bunch of boxes and Skittles. But in essence, what you're going to see is just trying to create clarity. Probably where it's going to be the most meaningful is, is in the areas of the subcommittees where you guys are doing the work. And I think the main thrust you'll see, just clarity on roles. So Lisa Abwaf um, is the executive sponsor. She currently is filling a role of manager, of which she also herself is uh, a director of the department. So the, we're in the process of hiring a manager. So that will be a new person that will be introduced to you in the coming months. But in the interim, Lisa's functioning in that role. Uh, you see that Kim Moreland still is going to be the project lead in this work, so that doesn't change. She offers that stability. Uh, what we've tried to do, though, is incorporate other elements just to strengthen uh, her work. I think you all know that the work is a lot, and it requires a lot of people uh, to really move things forward. And I'm actually excited that we finally have more people um, with appropriate skills, and I think we want to connect them with you as well so you can see that, that there's also just alignment with respect to like mission, like they get it, they want to do the work with you. Uh, I know something you guys have been like, hey, this is a lot of work. No, not one or two people can do it. So on the bottom rows, those are the, the five corresponding subcommittees. And again, you guys have helped us kind of craft what those should look like for this season. And we appreciate that. And in essence, what we've done, we've highlighted who will be supporting where. And so uh, for goal number one, which is property, promoting property ownership and redevelopment. Uh, Manefer and Joanne uh, will be the staff at Prosper Portland who will be working directly with the subcommittees. And I think some of the, if not all of you, probably have already met, but if you haven't, you will soon meet and connect with them. I don't know Joanne is here tonight and she'll be sharing uh, something here in just a few moments. Um, but they have a great background in uh, property development and community engagement in that way. So I think that'll be really helpful uh, just as a skill set. Uh, for the next one is supporting small business ownership and growth. Um, it'll be staffed by both Sue Lewis, who many of you have met. She's our program manager for our PIP grant, um, but also by Brooke. And Brooke is here tonight. Brooke is uh, within our lending team, and so he also has a background in supporting small businesses in the city as well. So you'll get a chance to interact with him uh, within that subcommittee. And then Kim will continue her work uh, within goal three, which is the investment into new and existing um, homeowners. Uh, and that's obviously done in collaboration uh, with PHB or the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, Sue will be the lead in terms of staffing for goal four, which is advancing community livability 
And again, it's those, the, the PIP and project, PIP grant program. So Sue will continue to be a point um, on that. And then last but not least, uh, it's that big one is the cultural business hub and Joanne will be running point on that. So I think the main thing that we wanted you to see is even with all of the moving, um, we're trying to still maintain continuity and we're also trying to just beef up the staffing side to support you in the work that you're doing in the direction uh, and recommendations that you give us. We can be uh, continually responsive um, in the months and years ahead in this work. Um, lastly, I'll say, and then obviously you have questions, we are also trying to work on creating a bit of a, like a transition plan so that it's not just moving people around and then kind of peace out, we're done. So um, I've committed, as well as um, one of our project managers, is to stay engaged with supporting Kim, and it also means to some degree staying engaged with the oversight committee, at least for the next three to six months. Naturally, as we go along, and just my workload increases in the other areas, I'll have to taper back, but we still feel like it was important, both for relationship, institutional knowledge of all that's transpired, and also a point of connection for supporting Kim as well as his team. So I'm not gone all the way, and definitely don't want to. This work is too important, and it's been really meaningful, but we also recognize seasons happen, change happens, and we want to just be as responsive and thoughtful in terms of making sure y'all feel like uh, we're still getting support, we're still, you know, value, and we're still being set as a priority, and that definitely is reflected in a number of ways, and one of the primary ways is do we have resources and do we have staff folks to address our questions? And we like to think with this current org chart that we um, have set up, you get yeses on all of those. Any questions at all? Thank you, Tori, first for um, taking some time to explain many of the shifts that we've witnessed happening and in particular, thank you for your commitment and staying on. That means I don't have to ask you to do that. You've already <laughs> offered, so it would be really important that you do that. I just want you to hear that from us. Um, and also, if you could have availability for us as well, that we could reach out to you by phone or email with mm -hmm. questions is really great. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely down to do that. I think that, like I said, as we go along, I'll have to be more realistic, but uh, inherently, I, I want to still stay engaged to the degree in which I can, so. Yeah. Any questions for Tori from the committee? I just want to thank you for actually helping steer this committee and congratulate you on the expanding profile that you'll have. And like I said, I just feel appreciative that you actually helped us through this process. Thank you. Okay, with that, we are going to move to the next step on our agenda, which is Miss Joanna. Thank you, Joanna. Please come and join us. And please pronounce your last name for us. Bill Gates. Thank you. <laughs> it's a hard one. <laughs> Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm here to present a project that I am working on, super excited about it. Um, we have the opportunity to purchase this property in, the, um, in Swan Island. I don't know if you guys are aware, um, there was a, a URA called Limited Industrial that has been closed back in 2014 and we, we opened in 2004. The reasons we opened didn't happen, but we were able to maintain some money that we wanted to reinvest in the, in the area. And that money has been there and we, we found this opportunity to invest in this property together with um, a loan from business organ that is specialized for public agencies and to create a share manufacturing space in the area. Um, the, the property has a large kitchen that we want to create a commissary kitchen, um, hopefully doing all the businesses like 100% affordable rates for all the businesses and focusing on entrepreneurs of color. The point is that the property is currently located in the interstate URA because interstate and Willamette Industrial are bordering each other. So our goal is to remove that property from the interstate, freeing the money in interstate to be invested in the community instead of investing in that and using the money that we already have to invest in that and create a lot of opportunities for um, people of color in the area. and. Um, a lot of needed space based on what I've been talking to a lot of community members. <laughs> um, yeah, so our goal is to be doing that in the next few months. Um, I'm working on all the numbers, making sure it works, but 
my goal would to have that done uh, by the end of the year. Go ahead. <laughs> questions from the committee, Maurice? You know, I guess my question would be, as far as how many businesses do you think um, can be utilized in that space, and what's kind of the vision for the space? So the vision is to, and I'll give you a little bit more about the property, so then I can go into the type of business. So if you look at that picture, that is the front of the building. It has a two-story, close to 20,000 square feet of office space that we are very limited on how we can use because that's an IG2, so we can really use just randomly as offices. Um, and then there is a close to 30,000 square feet in warehouse spacing. Within that warehouse, there is the kitchen that is approximately 35 to 4,000 square, 3,500 to 4,000 square feet. Um, the kitchen in itself, the way I am underwriting, it would have approximately four business a day that can use that kitchen. So it really depends on how many days. And then the warehouse, the goal is to subdivide with no more than 5,000 square feet for one business to keep the opportunity for smaller businesses. And on the, um, on the office space, like I said, it's very limited and it gets very detailed, but I would like to um, open a coffee shop in one of the corners that we can offer youth training. And I've been talking to two nonprofits to see if they are interested. So they can offer youth training as well as a space for whoever is producing uh, products in the space. They can expose and sell their products as well as uh, like a community area that people can see it and have and talk and kind of engage with each other. Um, and then the office space, um, I'm trying to find m potential manufacturing businesses that don't necessarily need the warehousing space. So I spoke to someone ha who makes clothes and bags. So that could be something that will go there. The way I'm looking at the numbers and given the kitchen and everything, we're looking at potentially 100 businesses that can be using the space. Mm -hmm. Oscar. And, and maybe this is more of a prosper polling question, but this bullet point about move, move property to a limit URA to use 4 million available resources, I, I guess I don't know what that means. That's what I was um, talking about. So the property is currently in the interstate URA. So if you look in the map, it's right on the border. Uh -huh. And then the Willamette URA, in that map, the Willamette URA is the white part. Uh -huh. And the, the interstate is the greenish part. So the prop is like one block into interstate. So we'll remove that. We'll have to make an amendment um, just to remove, so to transfer it to the other URA. So the 5001 North Lagoon Avenue, is that the property? Yes. And that, isn't that in the, in the Ikira, though? Isn't that, isn't that what the Ikira is or not? It's currently in the URA. What is IQRA? Sorry. Oh, it's the interstate corridor. Oh, right? sorry. <laughs> so then, if it's in the interstate corridor URA, why are we moving it to the? I guess I'm still missing something. <laughs> because we can only use the funds available in one URA if that property is inside of that URA, and the the money that we currently have available to invest in the property is in the Willamette URA. So we wouldn't be able to transfer the money to purchase this. If we wanted to purchase that under interstate, we'll have to use funds from interstate. And f it doesn't make a lot of sense if we have the money in the other URA and we can free the money from interstate for other work that you guys can do, we'll prefer to do that. Does that make sense? I think, yeah, I th that makes more sense. I thought I was... I thought the proposal then would be to use the, because it's also like about a $4 million ask, right? Right. So it's like there's a $4.5 million catalyzed cultural business hubs in the, in the Cura. Yeah. So, so I thought that that's what we were talking about. Yeah. So about. that's why we don't want to use the money in the interstate. So that 4.5 or any other monies can be used in other businesses. And we still have the money to invest on that from a different URA. So we'll free that 4.5 or whatever money to be used within the interstate URA. And since, so then that, does that mean that the Willamette URA has already targeted or earmarked 
the $4 million? The, the Willamette URA has that money there for a, a while now because that URA was closed years ago and we kept the money to reinvest in the area. So it's been there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think Oscar's question is similar to my own. This is such a win-win, why are we even asking the question, right? When we get to keep the money that we have, mm -hmm. that we maybe had earmarked for a cultural business hub or right. for other things. Um, but I understand that the question needs to be asked. Absolutely, and I think that's the, that's the point, is like just being clear and everyone on the same page. Mm -hmm. Hi, so just further clarification. Um, the amendment will add further resources to the goals of uh, the ICURA. Um, what is the dollar amount associated with that? Is that the, it's like a tit for tat sort of four million from the Willamette and so we get back four million or? You don't get back four million. We just wouldn't spend four million from right. interstate. Okay. So we basically, Central. trying to see how I can do like, um, so basically it's like instead of using our own money to think of interstate as us, right? So instead of using our own money to buy that, we are using someone else's money. It's basically that. So now you have your money to reinvest in something else instead of putting everything there. And we're not losing anything in terms of, because I know when we increase the URA, we're gaining tip dollars, right? Right. And so by, by reducing the URA, by removing this one property, we're not removing. It's very minimal. Okay. Because if you think you're only, you're only going to lose that tiny little piece of the property tax from that property, because we're not removing anything else. Yeah, it's just good to, I just wanted to know what, how, the, how it's going to balance out. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Leisha? <laughs> okay, um, I'm Joanna Fugates. I'm a project manager with Prosper Portland. I joined Prosper about five months ago, and I'm in the development and investment team. Okay. And my background is pretty much all real estate. <laughs> How does that work, do you know? I don't, I feel like I'm too new to explain and it's complicated. I don't know if Tori has a better understanding of that. Um, not to be dangerous, <laughs> but there is a provision, I believe, that even if a district is closed, but there's still money that is within it that has been unspent, that we are able to retain that and still can potentially use it for the, the reasons by which the urban rural area was and then, so is it kept in a bank earning interest? Is it kept like? It is. You do gain interest on that money. And it's, it's the, the district had reached their maximum indebtedness. And so that, um, so you can no longer borrow from that or, or you know, it, 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 it's part of a, it becomes part of like a saving. And so there is interest on that, on those funds. Where does that, what happens with that interest? But I, that's a really a Tony Bonds question mm -hmm. with our finance, which can kind of, uh, we can come back and follow up with that to kind of give you an idea of exactly how much is in the, the district and, and when did it expire. And so it didn't expire. It was closed because they, and I'll tell you the story, I know. So it, I may not know all the details because like I said, I've been there for five months, but the, the URA was open back in 2004, and it was open with the goal of Siltronic expanding their business. Of, of. Siltronic is a manufacturer in the area. Um, I think they're on the west side of the river, if I'm not mistaken. Tektronic. Tektronic. Si Siltronic. Siltronic. Something tronic. Yes. Okay. Oh. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and, the, they negotiated for a long time and the deal fell through. 
After a few years, um, they decided to close the URA and say, we're no longer going to collect taxes there, but we'd like to keep the money so we can reinvest in the area. By they, Prosper Portland. Prosper Portland. Um, within the same parameters that were decided that the URA, URA was created for. So basically manufacturing jobs and creation of within the industrial area. Um, I cannot explain to you why it hasn't been done, but when I joined, it was like, we have this money, we want to reinvest in the area. Um, there is a pos maybe we can look for a property that can um, qualify for what we're looking to do, create jobs and improve the economy and f qualify for both the URA mission, our mission, and you know, kind of put it together. I found this property and the reason it was so interesting is because I've been hearing a lot about both the reduction of industrial land in Portland, the need for space for small manufacturers and, and especially in the food department. There's so much food businesses here and the need for affordable space for, the, for entrepreneurs of color. So that's how the whole process of underwriting the property and seeing if it makes sense started. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you said that the URA is not closed, it's not expired, it's closed. Mm -hmm. Do you know when it expires? I think it probably has expired already, but that's not the reason they stopped collecting, they closed it. So if this property is moved into, back into the URA, is it then not closed or not expired? That's a legal question, I don't know. <laughs> we can follow up. Yeah, I, it has been a little bit of a discussion of how that works. Okay. Um, the reason apparently we can do is because part of the legal, the legality of it is you can create minor modifications if it is less than 1% of the original acreage and that URA was 750 something acres originally. Mm -hmm. So it will be a really minor um, modification to it. So we are able to bring it in, explaining that the, the mission for, the vision and the mission for the project um, is in accordance with everything else, like the, our mission and the mission of the URA, you know, so that's the reason they can do it. But now the nitty gritty of the legality, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Okay. Um, so then also, It's my understanding that, well, let me, do you need an amendment to move this property into the, the, the Willamette Industrial TIF URA? Yeah. It's a small amendment. So it's my understanding that properties cannot be moved per property. Like you can't have one property here and move it or add it to a URA and the surrounding properties aren't also included in that. For this particular changing of boundary, are, are you stating that it would just be this one building and not all of the other properties adjacent to it? So the way they would do it, the way they visualize doing it is going on, can I just? Sure. Yeah. The way they envision is the amendment would include this street here and then this property. Right. So just the street but not the properties on the other side of the street. Correct. So you ha I don't think we can just get this and be completely separate so we'll have to include the street and this. So that's how they would do. Okay. And it's just because it's close enough. If it was completely, like, if it was probably on this block, it would make it more complicated. It's just because it's close enough to the So, to the and is that a new thing, or is that? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I would just like to ask co-chairs and Prosper mm -hmm. Portland, I don't know what's being asked of us, if this is just informa information sharing conversation, but, you know, to have some of those questions answered, but also documented, and also 
what's the precedence or how do we determine? Because I know we've had conversations about adding one property or two properties and we usually are getting told that, oh, you have to add the whole this or that. So I'm just kind of wondering um, what, who's making those decisions about what is added and what's not added and what can, how can we look at this going forward in a more consistent way? Or if there isn't a consistent way, what are the reasons that would allow for it to be kind of changed? So Alicia, let me just start by saying I've started to document some of the questions so that they could be actually tabled and we could come back to them. Okay. So let me just take a few minutes and just let you know what I have. Okay. So you could help me out. Sure. Adding too. So we've got, if the property is brought back into the Willamette URA, is the Willamette URA then reopened? That's a question that we cannot answer today. Is that right? That, no, that it wouldn't be reopened. It's not reopened. I don't know what is the mechanism legally because we wouldn't start collecting taxes again. That's not, that's not part of the, the plan or anything. So what, what, what would be the legal structure or? In which this is operating. Right. Okay. That's the question because it's, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was closed. It was, it was both closed and expired at some point. The, I think the, that's a fair question and I think that question cannot be answered tonight. Is that right? right. Correct. Okay. The next one um, is discussions around interest on the Willamette, the money. You still want that question yes, answered please. as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then let's move on to, so we've had some inconsistency. Can, in can some you just repeat the question on the, uh, what exactly is the question you have on the interest? Where, how, where it's being used, where is it? How is it being used? That's my question. Well, so it just becomes part of the funds we have to be reinvested in the community. So the interest that's being collected on the $4 million that's sitting in the bank, it's just going back into a savings account that would be used back in the Willamette URA. Because we can use the money that is there, and I know the money has been generating some interest. It's definitely nothing big but it has been but we can use because we can only use that money within the criteria that are yeah no i understand that i understand mm -hmm. it can only be used in that URA. i'm just wondering i i was wondering how has it been been used or where it's been going it hasn't been used at all and if you look it's at been the going history back into a savings account and if you look at the history of willamette URA, i as far as i understand no money there has been used it's been there yeah, I didn't even know this URA existed, actually. So. And if you look at the, the or, Portland maps today, it's not there. Yeah, so this is mm -hmm. kind of just all kind of new stuff to yeah. me, at least. Um, yeah, so that's that's the question, but also about in, including the U. The, Correct, the so property. I have it as we've had some inconsistent reports on whether or not properties can be removed in and out of existing URAs. And how that's determined and the properties surrounding it so as an example, and this will go all the way back to the beginning, when we included uh, was Allen Temple mm -hmm. and, I, and, D, yeah, and Dean's views about, so Allen Temple is a great example where they were a block or two, I believe, off of the mm -hmm. urban area. So they, I think the phrase is a cherry stem, mm -hmm. which is going down the middle of the street in order to secure that one property. So mm -hmm. some of those do exist. I want to say, um, I wouldn't say Alberta. I think at one point they were also in the same way um, that district was historically in the urban rural area. No, so it wasn't. There, there is precedent of doing it down the street so you don't trigger everything along the way in order to secure a particular property. So there's precedent for that, but I think the other point of your question is how is that determined, right. that particular property, as right. opposed to something else? Right, yeah. I want to piggyback on that. Um, I think we could all recall Leslie discussing the property in Northeast where the goats were. I think the, yeah, the wall. Right? Yeah. Yep. I always think of it as where the goats are. Um, wasn't she looking for a similar? Similar thing. Yeah. Action. In order to secure that property, they would go down the middle of the street so that they would not trigger any other homes right. that were being impacted by What's it. the status of that? I believe they're moving forward on that if they haven't already. Uh, but we can we can okay. confirm that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please please confirm and please confirm how they got authority to do that. Because sure. I know that we didn't vote on it. Right, it was the Portland Housing Committee. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, they, that was within their preview to make a decision. Got it. So based on their recommendation, they were able to move forward to include that property uh, and so into the urban renewal area for housing related purposes solely. Got it. And is, and is it because this one is manufacturing that they're coming to this committee? Correct. Is that right? Yep. Okay. And, yep. and just to make it clear to you, um, the amendment would would only go through if we are in fact purchasing the, the property. We're not interested in just creating the amendment and taking it out. So we are still in the process of underwriting. Um, I'm hoping to make an offer in August so we'll have the due diligence time and, and the board has to approve the final um, the, the final terms of the offer and the, the final agreement, pretty much the contract that we of purchase has to be approved and we'll do we would present to our board both together. We want to purchase this property because of those reasons. They are in accordance with the, the goals of the URA. Therefore, we need to remove the property from interstate and put it into, into Willamette. So we, we wouldn't do it before. How does this move impact the, the businesses and the property in the Willamette URA, if at all? I don't think they would. So most uh, businesses there, they are the very large manufacturers there. Like you have Daimler right across the street. Um, the property has been on the market for a while. One of the reasons that is not as, um, um, one of the reasons a lot of the manufacturers are not as interested is because their bays are not very high. So the for the bays for the, the warehouse, oh. the ceilings, it's not very high, so for the very big manufacturers, they, Daimler has looked at it, they are not interested because of that, you know, the cost. And for us, as we're focusing on smaller manufacturers and creating that space, um, it would work just fine. Mm -hmm. so, so that last question would be, is this just a presentation or are we, are we being asked to do something? Wait, no, that's yeah, it's just an informational presence. So, and, and I just want some clarity. I, from my understanding, this is um, to inform this committee, but this is one of those decisions that isn't being made by this committee. Is that correct? So correct. Um, we, could, we could ask for the clarifications, but at the end, this is going to the Prosper Board, and they'll make the final decision. I think one of the things that they're trying to bring up is that this is a win for potentially 100 small businesses hopefully people of color, and that the, um, it also is not asking us to participate and give any of the money that we're in charge of to fund this venture. Yep. So uh, I just wanted to mention that a, a couple of years ago, or maybe one year ago, we were given a presentation um, which, Joanna, I don't think you were there, and I, I also don't think you were there either, um, that describes kind of the limitations and the, the constructs in which we can add and remove um, uh, properties from the URA. And I think it might be beneficial to kind of revisit those meeting minutes so that our, to add to our understanding of how, how this happens and takes place and see if it's inconsistent or consistent or, you know, all these different mechanisms, um, if they can, you know. Yeah. Shed some new light on that past discussion. Yeah. yeah. I will add that to our letter. Yeah. Thank you so much. I my simple comment is that I believe that there are a lot of businesses and individuals that can benefit from this, and um, I hope that with the due diligence that is done on all sides, that it is something that could um, transpire. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, next on our list is our subcommittee report outs. And we're going to start with proper property ownership and redevelopment from Maurice. Okay. Sorry, so uh, we, had, we had our meeting um, and we, we kind of discussed, um, yeah, there's not a whole lot of movement there, but um, looking at some of the stuff that we talked about before, which is casting a bigger net and engage in um, our navigators more into the work that um, we're planning on doing. So um, there's not necessarily a whole lot, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kimberly, there's not a whole lot to report out on that issue other than that we're looking at how to connect more businesses and more people into this work and not, there seems to be 
similar groups going to get the same types of resources from Prosper, so we really want to expand that into a, a wider net. Any questions for Marie? Uh, yes, sorry. Can you remind me who's on that committee with you? Oh, I'll have to pull it up. I thought you were on that committee. Uh, I, I, I only, I'm on the cultural business group. Okay. Do you have that in front of you, Kimberly, as far as the members of that committee? It's fine. I can find it. We okay. Well, it. we'll we'll share it's, it later. Um, it's yourself and it's Karen Ward and okay. I think it's Janisha. Yeah, that's right. That's it's right. It's the three of them. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, next committee report out is the Business Ownership and Growth Committee report out, and I will be doing that one. Let's find your notes here. Right. So the Business Growth and Development Subcommittee met on May 30th at Prosper's offices and in attendance was Maurice, Kim, Yvonne, and myself. Um, the focus of the meeting was essentially to get up to speed on past efforts and to review existing data. So there is the data um, and I want to start off by giving a, a sincere thank you to all who are involved in creating this data. This committee has experienced in the past some difficulty uh, with data, and so we're happy to see a new day. Um, it's impressive, uh, Kimberly, to see all of this together and to not only have data related to who the specific uh, companies and recipients are, but we've got um, detailed data related to ethnicity, uh, amounts requested, cost of the project, actual up-to-date uh, information on grants, dispersed amounts, status, product descriptions, and more. So again, this is, this is wonderful information for a committee like us to have at our hands. Everyone has a copy of it um, that you guys can put in your binders and keep handy. I know that this is the kind of demographic, demographic information that we need to do our job. And so I just want to validate that to say that we have it. Um, related to the actual growth and um, development subcommittee, our goals for the discussion in the meeting were that we wanted to um, look at where the funds are not being deployed. So we can see that there are gaps here. There are businesses who probably applied, uh, were approved, and then the the money was not dispersed. So we wanted to kind of understand what happened so that we can become knowledgeable um, and just learn from any lessons that are available how we might be able to assist applicants if there are bridges that we can actually uh, cover so that people can move forward. So there was dialogue surrounding that. Um, so with that, I will say that we're continuing to learn and we want to make sure that we're focused and poised about that. Um, the next item is we wanted to discuss outcomes needing to match the applicant's proposal, meaning that we inquired about existing processes. We wanted to understand what the applicant is actually experiencing. That's really important to this committee. Um, we got really good information in that meeting and we logged it. So as we continue to meet, I think we're going to feel like we can not only have closer relationships with the community and giving them the information that they need, but we can um, serve in our best capacity in that way as well. I'd just like to add that um, I, I do want to thank Pastor Portland staff, Amy. Uh, it was several uh, different coworkers who picked, um, came together and, and was able to compile the data and um, Amy uh, selected that, led that effort. So I, I'm really appreciating the support that I'm getting from uh, Pastor Portland to make sure that we serve you guys well. And also, I, I do want to say that um, it was really a great dialogue, and um, Sue Lewis um, really uh, helped to kind of, as we begin to really think about how we can better serve our clients and what are some of the, the reasons that some of our programs are being installed. And, and we also talked about, I don't know if it was this meeting, but maybe having a survey to ask, what is your experience? How can we? Um, as you go through our, our PIP program, are there ways that we can improve that program? And so 
I think we're getting some really good uh, traction from the subcommittee, and I'm really looking forward to working with you guys to make sure that our program um, uh, are successful. And I now go to PIP pro program, which is a 75, 25% match program. It's very popular. <laughs> it's always room to improve. So, um, uh, and I thank you guys for, for helping that process. Yes, thank you, Amy and Sue. Um, the last item I have here is we want to find ways to increase participation and diversify the applicant pool. I'm going to have uh, my colleague here, Maurice, speak a little bit to what that goal actually is all about. All right, perfect. Um, so one of the things I'd say is if you could print it just a little bigger, I am very old, so <laughs> um, I'm feeling older looking at this. I don't know if to bring it closer to my face or away from it. Um, but, you know, I think that there's, there's a few things, and one of the things I noticed on this, that there are some applicants that really, you know, really applied for the maximum amount, and others that really did not. And so it's kind of, again, that um, communication back to see why some of the ones I, I think are probably the most needy and that they actually ask for the least as well. Um, but really also looking at um, when some of the applicants say that what they're going to do in their application as it pertains to diversity and inclusion, that we have a method to actually kind of look at that and verify that, that that's actually what they said that they're doing, they're actually doing. And so that um, we don't make judgments off of necessarily um, incorrect information. And so, you know, we look forward to the subcommittee. I thought it was a pretty lively conversation, and I think we actually ran a little late, and so it was a lot of fun in the sense that I think we got a lot of work done and a lot of insight. So, I, again, thank you guys for that. I just want to add that when we originally came up with our outcome for the action plan, we just assumed that everyone would want to apply for the MAC. Um, but, you know, it's, it's averaging out differently than that, and so, which is kind of a good thing, so we have more money to spend. But um, there's various reasons for that, and, and one of them is sometimes they don't have the match, you know, so, so, so they're going to kind of spend what's available to them, so they're not going to take advantage of the, max, of the maximum 75000 because they have to pay 25% of the total project cost. So that, that could be one reason. And sometimes it, um, it doesn't, the, the, project, the total project cost doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not 75000 it's less than that. So it's, it's a, a variety of reasons for that. But we can, you know, explore that and, and do our follow-up and, and surveys and ask, you know, <clears throat> what is, you know, why, you know, what is the, to kind of come, maybe come up with a new average, you know. So there's, there's a lot of room for, you know, exploration in, in those, that area. Oscar. <clears throat> so I see that there's, at least from what I can calculate, there's one Native American person here who's able to access one of the um, uh, PIP, the PIP program, which is great. I would love to see, um, uh, I would love to see more outreach for the Native American community, and I would also love to see a mechanism. I hope it already exists, and if not, like the, creating this mechanism where some of these tenants or some of these applicants are being connected to the partners in the Inclusive Business Resource Network. Once you see an application, having them the opportunity to be directly connected, like a warm handoff to some of the partners on the IBRN to help them go through the process of filling out the application or helping them figure out how to maximize that opportunity. Thank you. And we, as you know, we have the community outreach navigator and also the business navigator that's part of that IBRN system. And, um, and I, oftentimes when I have one-on-ones and I bring other staff members, we, the IBRN comes up quite a bit. And um, we're also working with uh, the South District and they are also very aware of the resources that are available for their clients. And, we have connect several people to that network as well, but that um, that is really um, something that we we like to take advantage of. Awesome. All right, let's move on to our next subcommittee. 
Uh, that would be home ownership. And Maurice, you're up. And, and with the home ownership and the um, grant program, home improvement program, um, we really look towards uh, PHB to help assist us and the, the information on that, because as you remember, those are dollars that we had um, passed over to uh, PHB. Um, you do have in your packet a, a sheet, I believe we Can see. Can you hold it up, please? Oh. Second. And I, I believe this is um, unchanged with the exception of the ones that are highlighted in yellow, is that correct? Yes. Um, and so, and you could you could see the status. So this is a report that we've seen before. Um, and so, this is also, and I apologize for my confusion. This is also where we're doing the uh, recommendation. So we are going to ask a a vote. One of the, and also in your packets. Is there any questions on this first? So since we last met, there looks like there's potentially a fourth applicant for the down payment assistance and three for the home repair. And you could see where their value is for MFI um, and family size. Um, so why is the line number four blank across? Because the, the data hasn't been given to us yet, oh, and so we, we, we are waiting for the data from uh, PHB, but they, they have someone in the pipeline. They just haven't provided us with the information as of yet. And so everybody is awarded the same amount, no matter what? And so that was one of the, one of the discussions that we had, because we, we, were, we know every home's a different price. And if we're looking at down payment assistance, then we're saying, well, everyone's not going to have the same down payment. Mm -hmm. And so we were thinking, but the 100000 is the max. And so um, we believe it's probably just being maxed out. But again, this is, this is an area where we look for PHB to help inform us on. Um, so um, go ahead. So then the committed amount means that they have not purchased the home yet, so they're, so. I believe on the first three applications, the homes have been purchased and those have been approved and executed, although. Um, it, it's part of the down payment assistance loan program, mm -hmm. so that down payment goes towards the purchase of the home, so. Yep. So it is committed then? Yeah, it's, these, these are committed dollars right on this, this section right here where it says awarded amount. Oh, okay. And on the back is the dispersed amount. So that, that shows you the actual dollars that have been spent to date. The other form that's in you guys' packet is this right here, and this is actually asking for a vote. And it's pertaining to the ADU. Um, I'll let everyone get it first. And, and so and I believe this has been discussed in this committee as well that um, um, PHB was um, unable to deploy the ADU dollars. Um, and so, in the committee, uh, we had discussed taking those ADU dollars back and bringing it back to this committee and having us look at creating a program or looking at the redeployment of those, those funds. Um, and so there was conversations on seeing what um, Prosper and us as a committee can do to actually get those dollars out the door um, rather than to just have it be kind of stagnant because it's been stagnant for over two years when, with no movement as far as attempts to deploy the dollars or a plan to commit to the action plan. 
I'll take questions. Go ahead. Okay. Um, is there, I uh, does, um, I guess does PHB have a summary of why, of like a summary of their findings of why they were unable to deploy those dollars such that if we assume this undertaking, we can at least proceed with like a good understanding of what the pitfalls were or what the roadblocks were or, you know. So PHB hasn't, and maybe Kimberly hasn't articulated the why to the subcommittee, and I believe in the number of times that they've been here, um, they haven't really um, said the why. I think the we have had conversations um, within our subcommittee about the ways in which we feel potentially those dollars can be deployed for ADUs. Um, so we we're kind of caught in a little bit of a limbo because PHB hasn't said why they can't deploy the dollars, mm -hmm. um, but then they haven't really moved. They haven't given us anything of a process of how they even attempted to deploy the dollars. And I think that is one of the reasons why I think our subcommittee decided we want to get these dollars out the door. So bringing it back to us is. Um, Oscar and then Troy. Um, I, I'm fine with the recommendation. The only thing <clears throat> I would say that the recommended action stops at request PHB return 1.8 million for ADU construction back to Prosper Portland. I would make sure that it's the, the recommended action is to back to Prosper Portland's North Northeast Community Development Initiative Oversight Committee. Okay. So I just want to make sure that it doesn't go back to like a Prosper Portland. Okay. No, in a general fund. And, uh, so I, and I look to Prosper to make that friendly amendment. Can we put that in? Okay. So um, we're, we're going to accept that amendment. Uh, go ahead, Troy. Troy. I would say yes, we can do that. Okay. Um, I think also if, to further on that point, Oscar, it would also be important to capture here that the the expectation is that we would also evaluate, this committee needs to evaluate where those dollars should be reallocated within the, the overall action plan. So mm -hmm. just to like, you know, it's not just coming back, but it's that next step is having a fresh conversation of where should those dollars go. And I think Maurice is recommending that the 1.8 million goes into an ADU program that's sponsored by Prosper Portland. Great. But that's not what this vote is. Yes, it is, it is actually. So, so this this vote isn't to change the oh the purpose. The, okay, the, it's not to change the right. or recalibrate the utilization. It's for uh, Prosper Portland and the committee to look at how we can deploy the ADU program as it pertains to what our original mission uh, for those dollars or those or the original allocation of those dollars. If that was to if that committee was to come back and say we don't have a means of doing it, then that would be, again, bought up to say, okay, where are we gonna put those dollars? Kim, then Jennifer, and then Dorsey. And actually, one, that wasn't my, my response, but it wasn't to that, so, and it, I probably shouldn't have said anything because I misspoke. <laughs> <laughs> my thing I wanted to share, and I do, I think it's, it is important that we get PHB's findings. I think that's gonna really help you in, mm -hmm. uh, on evaluation of whether or not an ADU program is something that you should consider. What I have heard, though, is there were several reasons why um, they did not move forward with it. Um, some of them stem from the the original structure of how they wanted to call out what was uh, eligible for an ADU actually were just stayed within the existing home, so it was more basements, and so that that, that created a different level of both confinement in terms of opportunities for some homeowners, and also I think some homeowners because of that didn't necessarily feel comfortable with having in, um, their basement being turned into an accessory dwelling mm -hmm. unit where someone would literally be staying under them. I think some might have felt comfortable if I have a spot in the back, I can convert that, but basement, I don't know. So I think that was one thing, is just that it was confined to basements as an initial starting point. Also too, I think there was also um, concern that it triggers for a potential property owner a variety of new roles that they have to function in. 
and there was at that point, there hasn't been anything developed that would help them in terms of just being a landlord, <laughs> the, the, the tenanting process, you know, the, all that goes into being that. So I think until those things were put in place, they didn't feel like moving forward as well. So those are just two that I remember in conversations that I heard, but I think it would be well of them and PHB can for sure be able to provide all the detailed information as to why they chose not to move forward. And, and one of the things that the, uh, our subcommittee actually did talk about a bit was just that as far as if it's a basement or whether it's a, a garage that gets converted into an ADU or whether or not the lot size can fit a new building, whether or not there's some other mechanisms that could also help support the ADU, whether it's, uh, and I know that there's limited energy trust dollars and dollars associated with these types of programs, but also looking at different alignment structures and how we can align things that are current to actually have a multiplying effect on the capital investment. Um, and there was even some conversations about um, them being manufactured off-site and being dropped in place to actually reduce the costs. So, yeah, we did go a little beyond, you know, saying having someone in their basement, um, but we were looking at a series of different potential opportunities that we could at least do the initial research in, but I think those findings from PHB would be helpful. But I think that we were, we were hoping to cast a, a wider net as far as different types of opportunities before bringing it to this committee to saying whether or not we can succeed or fail. Yeah, I think that was it. It was just the, the narrow scope of what they felt comfortable in terms of constituting mm -hmm. an ADU program. Just fair enough. It was not. Just prior to um, getting to Jen, uh, Kim, and Dorsey, I just want to make a brief announcement about time. We're at 7.54, and we still have two subcommittees to report out. Um, I do want to have you speak into this, but just prior to that, if um, the committee could show by just either red or green if they believe that this is a decision that they can make tonight. So I think that will help us in knowing if we want to continue on. Yes. I, need, I need clarification on what we're voting for. Well, if we can even vote, if, if you believe that so. this is something that we should table, so we're just going to raise our paddle to see if this she is. She wants so. to know what she's she saying. She, okay, so what you're being asked to is that uh, uh, PHB has um, unable to deploy the ADU program. Um, and distribute those funds. So we are recommending that Prosper take the funds back. Um, and the amendment is to take it back to, with this and also bring it with this committee. Um, and I'm butchering your friendly amendment, Oscar, so I apologize, um, to then look at the deployment of those funds. So basically we're, we're but, about. But so where I got confused was I thought I heard someone say that we would be bringing those funds back to use in our own ADU program. That yes. would be correct. To, sorry, I'm trying to say this. But to add, basically, um, from what I understand, because I think I was at one of the meetings, mm -hmm. um, the subcommittees, um, PHB, they want to take those funds and put half back into you know, this, to our, our funding and half or part of it into mm -hmm. theirs. So that's the reason why that you're asking for us to take all of the funds and create our own program. I think that's something that needs to be made clear. Is that but, correct? To, but is, am I, are you saying that the only way we get the funds back is if we create a similar ADU program? No, I, and so we could say, if you would like, we could say we pull the funds back. What I was saying is that in our charter, those funds were allocated towards an ADU program, so we should be really kind of following that to see if we can deploy them. We might run into the same, hopefully quicker, results than PHP and say, we might come back, that committee might come back and, you know, uh, next month and say, we've looked at it, we cannot deploy an ADU program, therefore, we wanna use those funds for what we wanna use them for, not necessarily, um, and if we end up giving it some back to PHB, we give it back to PHB. If we say that we're going to use them all for a different program, then that committee has that ability to do that. We are, you know, I'm looking at what our charter is telling us that we should at least look at trying to do what um, those funds were first allocated to do. But. 
So it's up to the committee. I'm, I'm, I'm all for being able to make a decision on asking for the money to come back to our uh, plan, but what I'm not ready to or prepared to do tonight is to go on saying that it will be used for ADU program. Okay. Then is that you want to do a friendly amendment to scratch the ADU program out of language and saying taking the money back? Right. Jennifer. Um, I think the ADU program is something that we've also discussed in the past, and it would be good to revisit the meeting minutes just to just so everyone's on the same page as to how it's been discussed and what the pros and cons of it were, and that it might shed some light on why it's been unsuccessful for PHB to move that money. Um, also, I just want to clarify uh, that within the ICRA, there's our subcommittee and then the housing subcommittee. Mm -hmm. And so the housing subcommittee is under the purview. I, I feel like the ADU do, does fall under the purview of the housing subcommittee. And so if they, they then determined, made the determination that they, under the purview of you know, supporting housing um, within the ICRA, could not move the funds, then I don't see why how us in our purview of supporting small businesses would then really, um, it just blurs the lines a little bit. And I would need clarification on how, how that, like we pick and choose what goes where and what committee is responsible for what information, mm -hmm. I guess is um, something I would like to hear more about. Well, if I'm understanding correctly, um, the ADU program is, is, is a Part for Portland. It's part of this initiative. It's part of the middle income housing, new and existing um, housing policy. And so, um, and they have already decided that ADU is not something that they want to move forward with. And um, Leslie Goodlow um, some time ago did explain to us why um, those, they decided not to move forward with the, the program. Um, and she was supposed to be here tonight, and she could have, you know, explained more about why. Um, but I do think we should put a pause on this until we hear from um, the Portland Housing Bill. I was hoping that she would, um, that there would be a written document that you guys could, could read. But she um, was not feeling very well, and so she wasn't able to um, create the document that we talked about. And um, and also, she does, she does have a proposal to put half <clears throat> to a, the down payment assistance loan program so that you can um, increase the outcome of the homeowner mm -hmm. and then um, put another and put the other half back into this initiative. Um, so it would be a good opportunity to, to, to hear the alternative proposal um, if we put a, a pause on this um, tonight. And um, so I think it, you know, uh, I would just recommend that um, that you wait until you have more data. Is that what this committee wants? Yeah. yeah. I just want more information. Yeah. I, I, I feel like we're all confident in saying we want the money back, but okay. I don't under, It doesn't make sense for me to say we're bringing it back in the ADU. It's a subcommittee, talks about whether or not the ADU program works, and then we decide. So, 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 and I agree with you, I would second your um, friendly amendment to say bring the money back and leave the ADU language off of the recommendation. And so I'm willing Do you want to make a motion? Uh, yeah, I can make the motion to uh, strike the language on ADU, um, Is that but possible? what's that? Is that possible? Yeah. 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 I wrote okay. it. Awesome. Uh, well, I, I just didn't know like what the Fair terms enough. Yeah. For, of the PHB seceding the okay. 1.8 was. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is possible, as long as you remember, that this is a preliminary recommendation, yeah. and Lee, Kimberly Branham has the final. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> when when so was she waiting on us to make this recommendation? Because the notes, I feel like we we were asking for information from the last meeting by reading the notes. Mm -hmm. So was Prosper Portland waiting for us to make a recommendation to respond to the questions we had in our last meeting notes? Mm -hmm. So it says, Maurice asked if there was a deadline for which PHB plans to report back on the ADU program. If the dollars are to be deployed, the committee needs to know whether the program is viable or if they should be redirected. Then there's a whole list of bullet points under there. So I was just wondering, did we hear back from 
prosper or uh, were they waiting uh, for the Portland it? housing bill? We have not. That's what I was explaining earlier that um, we were una unable to get the information. Leslie was, was going to come tonight, but she was, wasn't able to. But we were also waiting on prospers to answer questions too. So that's fine if we don't have the answers. I, maybe you were waiting on to make this recommendation. I just wanted to know if any of this had been resolved. And I, I, I didn't go to the subcommittee meeting, so I don't know yeah, if that's been no. So could we, could we ask, pose the question? Would the funds come back to the CDI or be held by PHB for other purposes? And it sounds like. The funds, if you guys decide not to, to, to reallocate the funds, it will go, go back to the North Mercy CDI initiative. So it would go back as part of the um, initiative, and then we can de decide at the oversight group what your recommendation is to, to use those funds. So, so do we before, have a motion yeah. So we, so so we so we yeah. Like you, I was just gonna just say. So 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 we have a motion to um, take the money back, uh, scorch or uh, scratching the language on the ADU. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have a second on that motion? A second. Okay. Um, motion passed. Wait, we gotta actually take the vote. Um, so mm -hmm. all in favor of taking taking the money back. Taking the money back. Okay. Okay. Beige your greens. <laughs> Okay, now you're, now you, um, are you abstaining or? No. One more, okay. I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to make sure that the motion was clear so that oh, sorry. we yeah. uh, left here with a clear understanding yeah. of what would happen. Yeah. Um, agree? I, in speaking for Maurice a, a bit, I will say that this issue will go back to the subcommittee for more discussion and this committee will receive a report out from that subcommittee. Yeah. Okay, and please happy. attend. Okay. Yeah, but please attend the subcommittee, I guess. I, I, I want to, um, I just want to raise a question. If it's not going back specifically, specifically to the ADU, should it be going back to the housing committee? Or should it, or should this be maybe a, a special committee or, or go back to the general oversight? Um, it, go to the general. I, I feel like there has to be some kind of discussion or talking. We. I just don't understand where the where the decision is being made about where if we have all of the information we need to decide where this money should go. Are we having gaps in the uh, home ownership? Are we having gaps in the property? On it? Like, I think there needs to be a little bit of some understanding and and. I don't know. I'm not on a bunch of the subcommittees, so maybe I'm missing it. But well, in the past, we had the investment allegation subcommittee, right. and that's where you would make those broader decisions. So we could, you know, have a, a special committee to address those, and have you know, and, and invite you know members of the committee to serve on that. No more than four, because five would be a quorum. So if we can, if we want to, and, and then bring it back to the broader oversight committee. Um, I think we shouldn't make any decisions beyond the decisions that we made oh, today. Oh, oh. I think the decision making that we, we made today is a big okay. one. Um, and I think that the decision was to bring the money back to, yeah. yeah. And so I, think, I think we should wait until we get the report from Leslie to hear what she has to say, and then we can come back and see if we want to do this. If oh. we want to, keep the ADU program or if we're going to give them half the money and we take half the money. Like, if we don't have her report, I don't know why we're making a decision on this right now. I, I, Whether bringing it in, giving, taking it back. Like, I, knowing what it, what's going to happen. Right. Exactly, we don't even know what her report is, you know what I mean, so. But we do know that they're not doing the ADU program. Yeah, we, yeah. 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 So, we don't know why, and we don't know their proposal of what they want to do with the money instead. So, so, so. I, so for, just for time's sake, so we, we could always choose, the committee can always choose to have Leslie come and she says, I would like, let's say, somewhere around $50,000 to do this. And this committee can vote to say, okay, let's give back 750000 What we voted tonight to do is to take the money back so that we can start looking at, like you had mentioned, where those weaknesses potentially are, whether or not maybe you pr we can, have the flexibility to look at all our different options to determine how to best deploy these funds because right now they're not being deployed. And, um, you know, as far as for me as a committee, I feel like we've been asking this question from day one 
of how are these funds getting deployed. And so this is not a new topic matter. Um, this is a topic matter that's been going on for a, a few years now. And so I, I do agree that Leslie should come back and say what she would want to use additional funds for. And I do think that this committee should vote on that. But I feel like this has been just sitting there for a very long time. I guess perhaps the, the perceived fear is like, if we remove the money from this fund, these, this allocation, then we don't know how it's gonna be dispersed. The, the pro to the, the benefit of moving it is that we know that if it stays there, it's not gonna serve anyone any good. And so um, there's a little bit of risk in the unknown of how it's gonna get redispersed, but right now we know it's not doing anything, I guess is the, the summary. And one of the things I'd say is that this committee will determine how it gets redispersed. Yeah. Um, right now, it is doing nothing. Um, I would like to see, I apologize, a really clear vote on this. I'm not, I'm not sure I have a clear vote. I think we have an abstention. I'm not sure everyone's in agreement and we have a quorum. So we actually need a clear vote. If we could use our green and red um, cards now to say yay or nay. Can, I, can you see just what the vote is? Yes, you know, or we say, oh, yeah. so, say so, very so, specifically. So the vote um, is to the, for the ADU funds to come back to this committee for this committee to determine where those funds will be reallocated or distributed to. I want to believe it, but also when you say this committee, do you mean the overall this URA or the business, small business, what we are in charge the of? North North, the one that we, the North yes. Northeast. Yes, okay, just to clarify. Okay. Yes. Clear. It's clear. Vote passes. Next item on our agenda is community livability grant. Um, and I am up for that one. Um, I can make this really brief for us. So we had a, a meeting. It was a robust meeting. We got a lot of work done. In fact, we just met last week. Um, if you pull out your long sheet that looks like this. Oops. It's getting a little late in the day. <laughs> Item number four is advanced community livability projects and support nonprofits. If you look four columns to your right, you will notice that the total served to date is 24 and the five-year goal is 20. So if I'm correct, we've exceeded our goal in that regards. Um, Kim has said numerous times that this is a very popular program. Um, the intention of the program is to assist nonprofits um, with build out needs, uh, construction type needs, or infrastructure type needs, correct? Um, the total amount awarded is $2,080,000, and the amount committed is essentially $1.4. Uh, with the totals dispersed being 535. So that means of the amount awarded, only about a quarter of it has gone out of the door. That was a big part of our conversation is what's holding up the money from going out the door. And I'm gonna put Ms. Kim on the spot for her to answer that because she's very good at articulating that. Again, it's, it's a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes it's just development, um, the development process where it takes time to um, to hire contractors to get the work done. Sometimes the scope changes. Um, in one case, we had a nonprofit agency who had a large firm constructing hope, and they were really um, trying to decide whether or not they should um, invest that amount of money in a space that they don't own. And so they were looking for other options. So we extended their um, timeline um, so that they can um, explore uh, possibly new locations within the interstate corridor of the renewal area. Um, so it, 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 it's really um, 
um, depends on, on organization or capacity. We, um, there are several project managers that are assigned to each of the um, uh, grantees, and we work closely with them. And there's certain things come up. Sometimes they're awarded, but they may not have the, the proper zoning or, the, or they need to go through a change of occupancy. So that's another bureaucratic process before we could um, use public funds. You have to make sure that the zoning is correct, if you have the right occupancy. And so we kind of walk, walk through them, uh, walk with the organization through these various issues. It's very um, kind of individualized per agency. And so, um, and then uh, you, sometimes you see um, just a bulk of them completed at one time and then you, you have a low period where they're trying to work with their boards and, and, um, <clears throat> and it's just nonprofits becoming almost developers. And so it's, it's, a, very, it's, a, it's a learning process. So. Thank you for that explanation. The second half of this um, report out for the Community Livability Grant is to say that we're revving up to start again for this new year. Um, and we discussed several items related to that, and I'll just read these off and conclude this presentation. So we have applications opening in roughly six weeks. There will be office hours where applicants can go in and have face-to-face -face discussions, and the timeline for that is roughly August, September. Um, applications will be due in September. Application evaluations take roughly six weeks, so those should be concluding at early November, mid-November. And then there will be an internal review, packet preparation, packets out to the evaluation committees, evaluation committee meetings, recommendation memos to KB, and then award announcement expected in January. Any questions about that? Awesome, well, I, I think that we should all feel really good about the work that's happening with the Community Livability Grant and the commitment of that commi committee. And with that, we are moving to our next agenda item. Lost my papers now, thank you. Which is, oh yay, Cultural Business Hub, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, your timeline is going to be on the screen. Oh, great. Okay, good. I was hoping to have printouts, but yeah, I can also email this to the rest of the, or someone can email this to the rest of the uh, group. Basically, what you see is an updated timeline of um, how we plan on achieving, achieving our goals for the summer. Um, right now, we are, the asterisk represents the overall committee meeting. And then the meetings that are identified in with the numbers are the um, hopefully intended meetings moving forward um, to achieve a decision or some sort of summary of our findings and recommendation by December. Um, yep. So we are uh, meeting our goals of trying to conduct outreach. So our meeting was just yesterday and Joanna was present and we discussed um, how we're going to achieve the goal of meeting community outreach by uh, tabling events. And so the two events that are still um, available for us to table at are the Jazz Festival and the Pan-African Festival. Hopefully I got that right. And, uh, and um, so we've come up with a questionnaire that we can ho uh, have community members uh, respond to. And then we're also hoping to hear back from the local uh, minority-owned businesses and that is going to take the form of a, uh, us tagging along to a uh, online survey that's already in the works. So those, that will be achieved hopefully soon. And then the final um, outreach kind of feedback that we're hoping to receive is from local developers and what they see as you know, um, getting feedback on what's achievable for a cultural business hub for the dollar amount that we have. Um, yeah, so any questions? I think the, I think everyone should have already received the email, but we're looking for volunteers to help at the tabling event. Um, and then I think the slide after this is showing the goals lined on the left and our progress lined to the right. Um, yeah. 
And I, I just want to let you know I'm passing along this uh, sign-up sheet if you wanted to um, volunteer at the Vanport Jazz Festival. You will receive a VIP ticket with parking, and um, it's a lot of fun. We tabled there last year, and it was just an amazing experience. So I, it, I hope you can come. It was hot last year, but the VIP section will, um, if you guys been to the Collinwood Golf Course, they have like a guest house, and that's where the VIP sitting section seating would be so you can um if you i hope you will volunteer sweetening the pot there with the whole beer yeah <laughs> um i am actually interested to hear from you kim um if there were any developments based off of our uh outreach navigator and how um soul district sees their uh, role in assisting in the, these efforts you know um thank you for um, asking, and I, I did talk to um, Fawn today, and we're going to have a meeting soon to talk about um, some of our priorities for our community outreach. And um, I would like for them to be invited to our next subcommittee meeting so they can kind of get on the, on the same page and kind of get a, gain an understanding of you know, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and I will be asking them to join me at the Van Point Jazz Festival. And so um, we're actively engaged with the, the Soul Business Soul District. Um, and so uh, we can uh, utilize the network and to help us you know, get the word out about, about the various surveys. And, and also <clears throat> they may know of other developers that might want to be part of the round table. So, Alicia. Jennifer or Kim, um, for opportunities, who is, how are we finding opportunities? You, you want me to ask? You can go ahead, Jennifer. This is something that we discussed um, at length at our previous meeting. Um, the, I think there are a couple of uh, dangers to just releasing a, a giant map showing sites because we don't want to present the false notion that every site is equally developable and so an idea that or for the cert, a certain amount of money and so the idea that Kim floated was perhaps creating a couple scenarios of like development scenarios that uh, either are drawn from what Prosper Portland has engaged in in the past and also creating you know scenarios for certain sites that have been identified as potentially viable and seeing how that would play out hypothetically before trying to re release you know some some sort of master opportunity siting map but yeah internally it's definitely been discussed did you want to add to that yeah it, but, wonderful job <laughs> and, I, and I just wanted to add to that is that um, sometimes you know you, when you look at the cultural business have allegation is 4.5 million and another 1.5 for the retail tenants, which isn't a lot of money when you talk about a large, you know, development. So where would you maximize that money? Where are those opportunities? Um, you can have a cultural hub on the ground floor of a new housing development. You know, are there opportunities there, or <clears throat> do we really want to invest in a new new construction where the, the 4.5 would not go a lot? go very far or is there other people other development that's happening <clears throat> that um it could be gap financing so those are type of when we say opportunities how can we maximize this 4.5 and and what are some existing projects that are happening where we could fold those dollars into <clears throat> that project and create a cultural hub um at that that location and i'd like to add to that um maximizing the dollars definitely and then i'd also like to add maximizing the amount of people that we can serve in terms of so so the one on the one hand there's the consideration that needs to be given to the type of development and the type of uh, agreement that's struck and then on the other hand there's also well what what then does it look like is it a bunch of business smaller businesses is it <coughs> one big business that sort of you know trying to maximize the amount of businesses or small businesses being able to be served 
is another thing that we're trying to look into in terms of, um, uh, I think what we have also scheduled is our, a tour of different um, sites that we identify as potentially fitting the bill of a cultural business hub. And so that is, that is also added to that agenda. <laughs> Um, right now, the tour is identified. This is old, so uh, I think it's mid-September. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> How does the Hillblock site play into this? I, I have been trying to stress um, a distinction between this, uh, the Cultural Business Hub and the Hillblock site. It is not part of the URA as we talk about it right now. Um, and so we're gonna try to maintain our focus, <coughs> crafting as much, you know, gathering as much in, uh, information as possible from developers, from community members, and from small businesses, and let that lead us to a natural conclusion um, within what we, we know exists today. <coughs> I, I would just briefly like to um, say that I think it's appropriate for us to be mindful of the Hill Block, um, particularly as we're hearing that they are shifting their position and they're more interested in becoming a part of the URA at this point. Um, so with that, I think we should just be considering what that, would, what that would mean and how that might look and how we might be able to support. But I also want to be mindful, I'm sorry, that that may be true, but there are other sites that are, are equally, you know, interested in um, becoming a cultural hub. And so our focus is really to develop the criteria, and then, you know, and that criteria can be folded into their RFP or their NOFA or wherever they decide. But our goal is to really, you know, develop the criteria. Would it be with that in mind, is it, would it be valuable to have them uh, speak at one of our meetings coming up, depending on how soon they're going to be pushing a um, So they, there was some discussion uh, about um, the two leads of the Hillbach having a meeting with Maurice and myself. I know that they were able to meet with Haben and Risha last year, and um, so there might be potential there. Um, Karis, who's not here tonight, she couldn't be here. She has been encouraging um, for this committee to meet with them as well. So there has been, again, as I mentioned, just some shifts and some movement in that respect. And one of the things I would say is if, if they're, you know, it's great to meet if we're collaborating on resources and how things work. If it does pertain to the Cultural Business Hub, it should act, they should actually be meeting with that subcommittee um, so I would, I would, okay. Point of clarification. I think Leisha had. Oh, please, Leisha. Oh. Um, so who, who, um, John and Fawn, who are they, who are they working with? How are they working with the, the new, subcommittees and when will they report back to us on any um, outputs from the work that they're doing um, <clears throat> I, and can you tell us the name of their organization or who we gave who we gave the contract oh, to it's the Seoul district it's business it's association yeah. and at one time we did have the community outreach subcommittee and that made it really easy <laughs> but now um, they are uh, probably reporting directly to the Oversight Committee, the General Oversight Committee, and we can ask them to come and, um, and you know, provide an update. And um, they are providing, like, um, reporting to Prosper Portland through our outcome tracker, um, and I, I do have regular communication with them, but I, I did ask them, both the business navigator, Miso, and uh, so district to have reports. And I was hoping we would have it this, at this meeting, but our agenda was so full. But, but in September, we can definitely have it 
um, have them report back on their progress. And I, and I personally know they're doing a really good job and I've talked to several of the people that they have connected with and connected us to and so I'm really excited about working with them. Thank you. And, and the other thing, I, I was, my understanding is also that they're, and I think they were at maybe one of ours, but they were going to more engage with the subcommittees as well as far as it pertains to the work that subcommittees are trying to do. And they, they will, um, it's just that, um, it's so, it's five subcommittees, so we really wanna make sure that we're mindful of, <clears throat> and have a, you know, a specific reason why, you know, they can engage with us, but they are willing. <clears throat> Thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. Up next is Ms. Dorsey and our new committee members. Okay, so um, we met on June 6th. It was myself, Alicia Posey, Maurice Ramin, and Glenn Thompson, and um, Kim as well. Um, so the reason we caught the subcommittee for the new members is because we're currently down two members, um, and so we need to like immediately replace them. And then we have two other members that plan to end their term at December um, of this year. So we wanna be proactive in that. Um, so during the meeting, we, um, we went over the application that we used previously, um, and we kept everything pretty much the same, um, but we did add a video of um, one of our meetings for any applicants to review to see if they're interested. Um, so during the meeting, we created a timeline on you know what we wanted to do and, and dates and things of that nature, um, and so we decided to um, we reviewed the application, made sure that we were good with that, and then the application went live on the first of July, um, and I I was the one that went called most of the, well called all of the um, or reached out in some capacity to the committee members to see um, what they're committing to, and except for just one, and so I'm unsure about that, um, that one person. Um, and so the application deadline, it did go live the first, and the deadline was is August 3rd, um, and um, we, uh, the subcommittee was supposed to meet back again, or we are gonna meet on the 7th of August to review the applications, um, and currently, unfortunately, we have no applicants, um, and so that that's that sucks. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so I would imagine because this is really loud. Um, I would imagine because we we don't have any applicants, and unless we get some within the next like week, um, this seventh August seventh meeting, we'll discuss. We'll go over our plans. Um, one thing that Kim and I um, discussed. Um, is that you know uh, that the committee reaches out to people in our networks, sending out the application that way. So maybe we'll get some applicants, um, as well as I don't know if we can even um, if Prosper Portland can um, send it out again. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, our goal was to have the first two members um, that we need to replace immediately to start um, late September, but because of the lack of applicants. Um, August 7th, we'll probably um, discuss that and, you know, make a new timeline. And that's it. Um, how was outreach different this time than last time? Because it seems like you had a very different outcome. Yeah, I mean, I think the outreach was pretty much the same. We, um, uh, they sent the application to whatever the network is through Prosper Portland, just like we did before. We don't know if it's because it's summer, you know, and people just haven't gotten around to it or, or, or what. And so that's something that we do want to, you know, try to, you know, brainstorm to see if, you know, we can come up with that answer or, or just move forward and do some more outreach. And maybe even like at the, um, the Jazz Fest and um, the other thing that we're gonna table, that we can have some applications there and talk about that as well because, yeah, we need some applicants. That's actually a good idea. Otherwise, you can never go on <laughs> Your term will never end. <laughs> Maurice and then. Oh, no, actually, it was that one. That was the last one. Leisha. 
Facilitate. Uh, are these segments were coming back? The subcommittee is coming back. Yes. To and that's that's we that's to review the application. We were that was our plan <laughs> to review the application. So unless you know unless we get some applications by then, I think we should still keep that meeting. Um, possibly, I mean that's up for discussion. Um, and to go over, I'm sorry. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, to keep that meeting to go over, you know, to go to recreate another timeline so we can, you know, basically see what, you know, what other options we have in terms of getting applicants. So the August 2nd meeting. Second? Maybe the, uh, um, the doodle poll one. What, what's, what are we, select, what's the special meeting to review the subcommittee? Um, last day for subcommittee members to respond to the poll to select a date for a special meeting. Da, da, da. So that was the August 2nd was we, um, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, so the August 2nd one was for the subcommittee members to respond to the poll to select a date for a special meeting. I don't know what that was. Did we already do the doodle poll to come up with the 7th or? Yeah, we did the doodle poll, but that was another one sent out. That was July 25th. That was the over. I'm not sure. I just highlighted the most important things that was, you know, relevant for today. All right. And so, you know, those ones, I'm not really sure. Send out the doodle poll for special oversight because our intentions was we would, on the 7th, we would have, um, we would select, we would go through the applications and then we would um, call for a special meeting for the actual committee to um, uh, approve our recommendations for who we chose. Right. So I'm not sure if, you know, I'm okay. a little jumbled, you know. Um, and now we're uh, just talking, oh, I'm sorry, we're talking to Troy about we could probably, we have a week and about a week to really have a strong push to get more applications. So, um, we may, you know, if you guys could, you know, share it with your network, people that you think may be interested, um, that would help too, because sometimes it's that personal touch, you know, so. Yeah. We could um, definitely use Prosper Portland Network to, to move this, to get the applications out again. Who are the two members that are not not continuing on? Well, right now we, um, Hobbin and Khan. And then um, December, it's you and um, Oscar. And Oscar, can you remind me what your specialty was? In, in what sense? And I feel like <laughs> we all had, like, I don't know what mine was either. I was just like a community member. <laughs> Were you representing nonprofit? Were you? I think that was one of them, yes, among other things. And we did discuss in the meeting, like, and I don't have that written down right now, but that did remind me of like what we're looking for. I know we're looking for a developer and then finance, someone on finance. So that was something that we were, you know, when we review the applications that we were going to, going to, you know, try to make sure that we review and try to pick someone that's like a developer and someone in finance, right? Because mm -hmm. Robin was finance. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I just wanted to say like this, this, um, this in particular as well as uh, the tabling event is another scenario where I feel like Seoul District as our outreach navigator really needs to step up a bit. And, and I, know, I know behind the scenes they're doing a lot of work. These are the couple scenarios where we can use our own internal network, but we've also paid someone. Yeah. yeah. And the application does state that, you know, we are prioritizing um, real estate development, I believe it says. On a, it, it, it's specific. Did we add that language in there? That could, that might be why we have low numbers too. Oscar. <clears throat> yeah, I would echo what Jennifer just said, and I would also encourage that the St. John's Center for Opportunity also is like an outreach partner since they have such a robust uh, network of uh, business folks. That's really good. And then I would also encourage us to consider um, actually providing a stipend for folks who may, uh, the time commitment may be a barrier for them. So being able to <clears throat> utilize uh, committee members, uh, some of the funds to be able to like provide stipends for folks and that would incentivize some people who were actually trying to reach with this plan to be part of the committee. 
I agree. <laughs> you, you want to make a motion of that? And, we can, and can we retro that? And can we retro? I'm just fine. Whatever we decide. You know? <laughs> if I need my check. Um, I'm happy to make a motion, not probably not tonight, because I think we can work it out, but yeah. like maybe bring something to the next committee and I can work something out in the meantime. Sounds good, thanks. Um, and you can always email us if you want feedback in the meantime as you're working on it, but I appreciate that. Next item on our list is an update from Housing Bureau. We know that Mr. Lowe is not here. Um, and the last item is a progress report from Amy Fleck. Was she here? No. Um, I'll I'm Amy tonight, <laughs> but you, you guys have gone over most of the documents anyway, so um, you guys received several reporting documents. One was this is my favorite one, which kind of makes it easy to see how much money has been awarded, committed, and dispersed. And so, and you can, um, and then we have that list that shows all of the clients that we have served through the CLG, the PIP grant and um, the housing, and, um, and you also have this, what we're calling a progress report, and we're gonna produce this on an annual basis, and this, I love this one because it highlights your work <laughs> and the work of the oversight committee, and so this is a document that we will be producing um, on a, a, a yearly basis. Yes. Um, this document came from a request from the investment allegation subcommittee who wanted more narrative to supplement the quantitative data. Right. And so um, I'm really proud of this document and mostly because it, it highlights your work. Your good, you know, so. so just so that we're all clear, this is the document she's referring to. And um, Alicia, you are the only one from the, you and Maurice are the ones left from the allocation committee. So I just want to personally thank you. Um, that I can hold this document in my hand right now. And I would also um, like for this to be added to our next agen agenda, because I would prefer to have someone actually make a presentation on it. So as long as we could loop that back, that would be great. Okay. Um, correct. Okay. Um, unless anyone has any questions, we are formally adjourned and thank you for staying so late. Yeah. Yeah.